Good morning and welcome to uh, GNI's first annual learning forum. Um, I'm Susan Morgan and I'm Executive Director of GNI. I think today really marks something of a milestone for GNI. Um, we launched our organization at the end of 2008 with a set of principles and implementation guidelines, which were really the product of two years of hard-won negotiation between um, different stakeholders that based on international human rights standards. And we had a charter that was governing our work and an aspiration that over time, what we would do would be to start to seed a global standard on corporate responsibility, on freedom of expression and privacy issues in the ICT sector. Today is certainly the first time in the two years that I've been here that we've brought together in one room so many people who are either directly members of GNI or interested and involved in the issues on freedom of expression and privacy in the ICT sector that we address. So if we look back at the reasons why GNI emerged, I think what we see now, what's happened over the last few years, is we've just seen how relevant these issues are for companies right across the ICT sector and for so many stakeholders in so many countries. And we've also seen many illustrations of just why the issues are too complex and fast moving to be solved by any one stakeholder group alone. The original inspiration for GNI was in part to create a framework to really guide responsible company action, to help companies integrate thinking about freedom of expression and privacy into the way they do business. And I think alongside that, the thinking was really that by bringing together an unusual set of actors uh, to work together on an ongoing basis, that over time we'd be able to develop the kind of trusted relationships that would enable us to work effectively to tackle some of these really difficult and challenging issues. There was and continues to be um, a, a strong belief that there's benefit in working together rather than working alone. So I think we've made some strides in this direction, although I think it's fair to say a lot still remains to be done. We've seen our membership increase across our four constituencies, so that's companies, human rights groups, investors and academics. Um, this is vital for the strengthening of our network over time. We're becoming increasingly vocal on policy issues internationally, and again, this is something that we would expect to continue to grow. We've begun to develop learning streams um, within GNI focused on things like intermediary reliability, account deactivation and content removal. And in recent months, we've started to put some real focus on things that are happening in particular countries around the world. And earlier this year, the first independent assessment of our founding three member companies were completed. You may have seen the outcomes of these that were presented in our recently, uh, recently released second annual report. So today, I think, marks a milestone, not only in bringing people together both in the room and on our live stream, but also in terms of starting to distill some of the collective lessons we've learned so far and to help in our future work. I wanted to take a few minutes just to take you through the format for the day. So you'll see, hopefully, on the agenda that we've got three sessions this morning. I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Ian Brown from the Oxford Internet Institute to our event to talk about the findings from the research report that he's been working on, which we commissioned. He's been working on it jointly with uh, Dewa Korf from London Metropolitan University. The report was developed through uh, a series of interviews with many different stakeholders in different countries. We've had held consultations here in DC, as well as in London and Delhi. And really what we've tried to do here is to start a conversation on some of the most difficult issues related to freedom of expression and privacy. We hope the report's going to engage people in a discussion on the recommendations, and we'll look forward to being part of that discussion going forward. Hopefully you'll have picked up copies of the executive summary on your way in. Uh, if not, they're uh, just on the table out to the left. Um, and the full report can be downloaded from our website, which is globalnetworkinitiative.org. Ian's presentation is going to be followed by a panel discussion on the many issues that are raised in the report around freedom of expression, privacy, national security and law enforcement. Our second panel is going to focus on some of the emerging issues around the world in the ICT sector and we'll hear the perspectives of several GNI members on some specific examples of issues being faced. 
and the challenges and dilemmas that they pose, not only to companies, but also to users and freedom of expression and privacy rights. And finally, we wanted to give the opportunity for some members of GNI's board to have the chance to reflect on lessons we've learned so far and to offer some thoughts for the future. We want it to be a lively and interactive morning, so don't hold back. Please, you know, ask questions and raise issues and, and uh, ideas. And then after lunch, we've got a session which is specifically for uh, GNI members. Before handing over to John Kampfner, who's going to moderate our event, I'd like to, to finish with some thank yous. Firstly, to the New America Foundation for hosting us today and all their help and support in making this event work. Second, to those who traveled considerable distance to be with us, we're delighted you're here and we look forward to your contribution. And then finally, I just wanted to take a moment to thank GNI's incredibly engaged board, our independent chair, and David Sullivan, who's our comms and policy guy, and who they all play such a vital role in making our work happen. It's now my pleasure to hand over to our moderator for the morning. Until recently, John was CEO of the UK-based organization Index on Censorship, and we're really delighted that he's now working with us as GNI's European advisor. He has a long and distinguished career as a journalist, so I'm hoping that we're going to be in good hands. Over to you, John. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, great to be here, and um, it's great to see um, so many uh, familiar and uh, new faces as well, um, everybody bringing their own different expertise um, and perspectives to uh, this uh, incredibly important issue um, channeled through three separate discussions which we will be um, uh, having this morning. Just some technical points. Uh, if you have mobiles, please put them on silent, but please do tweet away um, vociferously, voraciously. Think of any adverb you like. Um, at, um, the hashtag is GNI2012, and if the Wi-Fi uh, continues to work, it will come up on my laptop and I can um, uh, relay some of the uh, tweets um, to our panel. Um, so uh, without further ado, what I will do first is invite the three panelists who are uh, here with us today to come on stage. Um, when uh, the panel discussion begins, um, we will have um, Beamin Sunil Abraham from India. Um, but first, could I um, invite, you have all their biogs with you, um, so I won't give long biogs, I will just simply um, invite onto the stage our participants, uh, Dan Baer from the State Department, Bob Borstin from Google, and Gillian York um, from the EFF. <laughs> Good. And it's my great pleasure to ask Ian Brown to come on stage to um, explain away his report. Ian. Do we have the, uh, do we have the slides? Thank you. Perfect. And the clicker. So um, thank you, Susan. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm going to try to summarize the highlights of a, a quite dense 50-page report here. So please do uh, download and uh, look through the details. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sorry, the, the title of the report is Digital Freedoms in International Law, and the subtitle is Practical, Practical Steps um, for the, very, the Stakeholders Involved in the GNI Process to Take on Privacy and Freedom of Expression. We mean in particular international human rights law, the international, especially the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, Article 17 and 19 on privacy and freedom of expression, and their interpretation by the UN Human Rights Committee, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and various UN Special Rapporteurs. Uh, I'm sure you, you have all come across Frank LaRue, who, who uh, has been the Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, but also other Rapporteurs on the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while Countering Terrorism, and John Ruggie, of course, and his work on human rights and transnational corporations. Secondly, I'll talk a bit about export controls and the, uh, the particular international agreement there that is relevant is the Vassanar arrangement on export controls. Um, so the ICCPR, 
uh, has 167 state parties, uh, very broad coverage around the world. As you can see there, uh, from the dark green um, are, are the, uh, the, the countries that are state parties. Uh, the Republic of China did sign the covenant, but the People's Republic of China has not ratified it, uh, the, the largest country there. Saudi Arabia, Cuba, a couple of other countries are not parties, but, but by and large, this is a, the, the covenant is a, a, an agreement that has very broad consensus around the world. Obviously, um, with varying degrees of compliance by different, uh, different countries, um, various degrees of remedies available to people whose rights um, have been wronged. Um, the reason we have focused in this way is not to say that the, the covenant is always and everywhere observed. Clearly, clearly it is not. However, it, it sets a powerful set of norms um, for, for states themselves, for companies to look to when they are making decisions about entering and perhaps exiting markets, and also importantly in international discussions between states, uh, especially the Internet Governance Forum and uh, related areas. I also wanted to make the, the important introductory point that the human rights law is, includes, importantly, security of the individual, as you can see in this quote from uh, the High Commissioner's fact sheet on uh, human rights and terrorism. Clearly, uh, terrorism and serious crime seriously damage the security and the rights of individuals, and it, it's, it's perhaps the principal duty of states under international human rights law to protect individuals' rights. Um, and so I just wanted to make very clear and emphasize this is, this is not a report or a presentation that is one-sided, that is focused only on the freedoms. Um, the, the security of the individual is a, is a fundamental freedom, perhaps the most fundamental freedom. And the rights are not absolute. That, that's an important thing to say as well. In the, in the covenant, most of the rights in the covenant, including to freedom of expression and privacy, are qualified rights. There are circumstances in which states are perfectly justified in, in limiting those rights for specific reasons, not least to protect the security of individuals. When those rights are restricted, there are some basic tests under the covenant and, and these, ex, these ex, in, interpretations and expansions of it uh, that states have to meet. So you, I, I won't go right through them, but you can see them there. Importantly, they should be based on published, clear, and specific legal rules, serve a legitimate aim in a democratic society, and that absolutely includes law enforcement and the protection of national security. Uh, the restriction should be necessary and proportionate to that legitimate aim. They should not involve discrimination. They should not confer excessive discretion on the relevant authorities, and they should be subject to effective safeguards and remedies. There are further special circumstances, which in practice is often where the focus of these international debates are um, when it comes to a time of war or other public emergency threatening the life of the, of the nation. So very, very serious emergencies. Um, states then can go further to restrict rights, but only to the extent that is strictly required by the situation. And even then, um, those restrictions should not involve discrimination. Uh, they should be officially proclaimed and notified to other state parties so that other states can assess the measures that are being taken. Um, and this is something then, obviously, uh, th that's important for, company, for companies to know as well. Secondly, in relation to terrorism um, and other serious breaches of public order, um, there are important discussions about what the definition of terrorism is. So you can see there the definition from the, the, speci the special rapporteur that I mentioned that terrorism is hostage taking, killings, or serious physical violence undertaken for the purpose of provoking a state of terror or compelling state action. Um, but even, even there, um, a couple of key, uh, key things to bear in mind. That first of all, Except in cases of very severe terrorist attack, which, which reach the standard in the first paragraph that threaten the life of the nation. By and large, within this international law framework, states should deal with terrorism in the criminal law framework. Um, and it, it will not trigger emergency powers. And, uh, and secondly, within those restrictions, in that, in that framework on rights, there should be clear safeguards for the rights of political opposition parties, for trade unions, and for human rights defenders. Last in this, this area of international law background, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, the, the RUGI principles as they're often called. Um, 
this, this framework, obviously the, the, the human rights law framework is mainly targeted at states, although states do have a duty then within their jurisdiction to protect rights of individuals, sometimes against other individuals and companies as well as against the state itself. But, but looking more explicitly to companies, the RUGI framework has three core principles. You can see there the state's duty to protect against human rights abuses, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and the need for more effective access to remedies. So concretely, when companies in a, uh, a repressive regime uh, face demands that violate human rights, they, in, in this framework, companies have a duty then to refuse to do so where they can. Obviously, there are very important practical questions about the degree to which companies are in a position to, uh, to deal with these, these demands in this way, minimize the extent of any such cooperation, and help victims of any enforced cooperation. The GNI principles themselves um, actually fit very well within this framework. They, they predate the, the Ruggie principles by a number of years, but they actually they go much further than the Ruggie principles in making concrete um, and, and explaining in operational terms uh, what companies following those principles can do. So having set, given you all of that background, let me just highlight some of the, the recommendations we've made in, in this area. Um, they're, they're set out in, in more detail uh, in the report. So first of all, we found that, that companies were eager to, um, to learn more from each other and from other relevant parties, whether that's NGOs, governments and so on, about the, the detailed information they need on specific legal systems in markets that they want to enter and, and continue doing business in, and practical experiences. This is something obviously companies have to do themselves already before they go into a market, um, but there's a lot of knowledge which at the moment is slightly fragmented between companies that's in a forum like GNI, for example, I think could very productively be, be better shared. And that would, that would then help companies making those market entry and exit decisions, but also importantly, where companies are being faced with demands for um, the termination of connections, for user access to user data, and for blocking access to specific um, content, where companies are faced with legally binding demands to do that, which, which is the standard that we've, re we've recommended that they follow and which by and large already many companies are following. Uh, obviously to, to know what those legally binding standards look like, you need a good very good understanding of uh, local laws. Secondly, um, in terms of the, the, the ruggy duties that I was just talking about, uh, we've recommended that um, governments and companies look more into uh, what kind of mechanisms that might be put in place uh, to limit the use of products and services for serious human rights violations, whether that's in the, the terms of use and, and conditions and the contracts relating to the use of those products and services, whether that's greater support from diplomatic services of the democracies in supporting their companies in disputes in, in countries over the use of their technologies where there are concerns about human rights violations, whether that's technical measures that companies could take if they, are, if they are selling products into markets as opposed to services which obviously remain much more directly under their control, are there technical measures that, that they could make um, so that in the final um, analysis, if, if their products are being used for systematic serious human rights violations, that actually that they can stop the use of those, those products. We've recommended that in line already with the, with the GNI principles, that companies plan very carefully on how they store data about their users, where they store it, in which jurisdictions. Um, do, there, there, are, there are a very broad range of different standards in different jurisdictions, even between the US and Canada and different European member states, um, on, on the situations under which data can be accessed. That's something, again, if companies know uh, know more about legal requirements in specific jurisdictions they can think about. We've also recommended that there be a renewed focus on mutual legal assistance tr treaties as the best way for states um, to order international access to user data. At the moment, many companies are slightly uncomfortable at being put in the position where um, government agencies are coming to them and asking for voluntary cooperation 
to provide user data about people within that jurisdiction. Companies don't always have all the information they need to make that decision. The traditional international law uh, framework is that procedures to protect the rights of all interested parties are set out in mutual legal assistance treaties. Um, those are very cumbersome today. In practice, often take much longer than is necessary um, for the kind of situations that, that law enforcement agencies need data for. So if, if this would work, it would have to be under a, a much streamlined and speedier MLAT regime. And then finally, we recommended, uh, I, I think most people are agreed, transparency is a, is a positive um, measure, both on states and companies. Uh, so GNI's, GNI's own members have gone a long way towards doing this already. For example, the, the Google Transparency Report is an obvious example where Google has been adding more and more data about takedowns, about user access requests. We think that's a very positive framework. Great if companies can do that themselves. Some companies have concerns about publishing figures just relating to themselves, but would be willing to share that data confidentially, perhaps within groups like GNI, and then aggregate data be produced. Um, so second, second smaller part of my talk. Um, as you all know, there's been a lot of criticism over, especially the last couple of years, uh, where, it, where it has turned out that companies in particularly North America and Europe have been exporting technologies of mass surveillance and mass censorship to repressive regimes. And, and this has understandably got huge media coverage when, for example, NGOs go into the former uh, torture palaces of regimes in the Middle East and find rooms installed by French companies, for example, to, um, to help those regimes track down political activists. Um, the obvious response to that, but I'll explain the, the subtleties hopefully, uh, in the time that I have. The obvious response is to say companies should not be providing products and services like that to repressive regimes. Some companies have indeed said, you know, they have corporate policies, they will absolutely not sell products and services into those kind of regimes. Uh, of course, the, the problem with a purely voluntary approach is you then put pressure on some companies to profit out of the good behavior of more scrupulous companies. Second difficulty, many of the, it, w when you start drilling down and say, well, how exactly do you define these products and services that we're talking about? Many of them have completely legitimate um, civilian uh, applications. Some actually are mandated by the democracies. So uh, things like lawful intercept capabilities and communications networks, for example, is required under the, under the law of the US and the UK and many other uh, companies. Again, many of the tools that, on the one hand, can be used for mass surveillance are actually quite important capabilities for network operators themselves to have in managing and running their own networks and, and keeping them secure. US and EU sanctions, uh, most specifically on Iran and Syria, include some technology bans. And you'll know, of course, uh, in April, the White House went further to try to impose controls uh, to target those that create or operate systems used to monitor, track, and target citizens for killing, torture, or other grave abuses. Um, the, the difficulty, first of all, with relying purely on a sanctions-based approach is uh, it's, it's very narrow. It, it, by and large, sanctions are only put in place against country, countries and governments that, that have already gone a very, way, a very long way down the road in serious human rights violations whilst allowing other repressive regimes to build surveillance infrastructures and censorship infrastructures that then might later be abused. Sanctions politically are very hard to agree between the states, um, understandably because states have significant companies that, whose, whose business interests they do not want to, uh, to damage. The practical issues about controlling exports of technology, the, the, the very long-running uh, attempts by Western governments to, to restrict the export of encryption software in the 1990s is a good example of how very difficult indeed it is to do that. And I, I think the time is long gone when software components, purely software components, can effectively be export controlled. I think you have to focus on hardware. Can you define controls in a way that won't damage legitimate sales? 
uh, that won't be easily circumvented by bad actors. And one of the civil society experts we interviewed, you can see the quote there in the second bullet point, said, despite a great deal of work in trying to do this, they, they were yet to see a workable definition that wasn't too narrow or conversely so broad that they undermine the activists in those regimes that, um, that they are trying to help. That has also been a problem we've seen with the, the sanction regimes that I mentioned, that it, many companies are very nervous about allowing any use of their products in Syria and Iran, even when those products might be incredibly helpful to democracy activists, even when uh, governments like the US government has, has have made a lot of efforts to try to clarify controls, to create general licenses, to give advice to companies. Uh, there are such uh, strong penalties for breaking some of those controls. Companies are still quite nervous about it. And last but not least, the equipment is not just sold new internationally, but actually a lot of it is available on the second-hand market because as ISPs, for example, in the advanced economies are constantly upgrading their networks, sometimes then they have equipment um, that might come under some of these definitions that they are quite happy to sell and, and will do the job perfectly well in many uh, less advanced economies um, who don't have super high bandwidth networks and who actually where repressive governments are most interested in international traffic, which relatively speaking might be at, at quite a low volume. I mentioned the Vasnar arrangement already to try to, if, if, if you're going to go for export controls at all, uh, to try to prevent a race to the bottom and, and to get maximum coverage. Th this is the obvious choice. The, the 41 member states of this arrangement coordinate their controls and share information on them. Um, but having said all of that, what we've recommended here is more tentative because there was much less consensus on this amongst all across our interviewees and our workshops. Um, first of all, that these, these international arms control and export control regimes currently are targeted almost, almost purely on military capabilities and preventing the build-up of military capabilities. So we've suggested that a, a, a further object of protecting human rights against serious violation would be a useful extension of those regimes, and that done that states could then consider including technologies that are primarily or significantly useful for human rights violations in those, in those regimes. Um, Vassanar itself, because of the way it grew out of these mainly military-focused uh, controls, is, is quite a traditional state-to-state -state grouping. Of course, states do consult with companies and with NGOs in their own jurisdiction, but the Vasna itself doesn't have the, the formal multi-stakeholder engagement that you get at now at places like the OECD and most obviously in the Internet Governance Forum. So those controls might be better targeted if you brought stakeholders more formally into that arrangement. Um, and at the same time, actually, I think even within Vasana, there are still some of the controls there that are really showing their age now such as the information security tools controls, which absolutely get in the way of tools that are useful for activists. So Tor, for example, that we, that we talked to said they are still having trouble, despite on the one hand being funded by governments to develop Tor as a tool for human rights defenders in repressive regimes in getting export control licenses and, and the permissions they need uh, to export that there. And that is it. So Thank you for listening. You can see the full report. We would welcome feedback to this email address. And let me just say thank you to everyone that we interviewed that came to the workshops, to the Open Society Foundations for funding the research, to Eric King for the technology export maps, and to Susan David and the GNI members who gave us a lot of help in putting it together. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. If you um, take a seat and if I ask the panelists to come back on their dance up and down the platform. Um, I very much commend you uh, the report. Um, I hope uh, it, several of you will have had a chance, if not to read the whole report, which is um, also available online, um, to have at least read the executive summary um, as Ian outlined with the um, uh, the, big, the big picture questions and the recommendations as well. And just to say, uh, this is being uh, live streamed uh, this morning's session. Um, so uh, anyone uh, watching us um, uh, from afar, we, we welcome you too. Now let's just hope uh, there is uh, Sunil. 
Um, Sunil, can you hear us? Yeah, yes, I can. Good. And can the audience, I think we need to up the volume for, for Sunil. Um, anyway, very, uh, very warm welcome uh, to Sunil Abraham from the Center um, for Internet and Society in India. And uh, we saw you here in DC, Sunil, at the Internet at Liberty um, discussions just a few weeks ago. And it was very good um, to see you um, uh, offline um, a few weeks ago. And now very good to uh, see you um, uh, today. Um, Dan and Bob and Gillian, thank you very much indeed. And I hope you've had time to absorb some of um, the report. And just to say that I will be with the co-author of uh, the report, Dowie Korf, in Stockholm tomorrow um, at the Eurodig conference, where we will be um, presenting it. Say again? Flaystroffer, yeah. Um, we will, um, that's if the connections work. Um, where we will be presenting it there. So, um, Sunil, um, did you manage to uh, hear Ian's presentation? And uh, just first of all, yeah, yes, I did. I got most of it. I think the connection is a bit flaky, but I got most of it. Good. Um, I just maybe we'll start with you, um, Sunil, while we uh, have you uh, on the line. There's been quite a considerable and consistent pushback in India um, in recent months on a number of freedom of expression issues. I'm wondering whether, uh, in, to what degree, this report, with its um, attempts at a, at a tighter definition of uh, the questions of terrorism, um, what one might call the powder keg argument used by Indian federal and state governments, um, to what extent can this help influence the debate in India and in other countries grappling with the twin dilemmas of free expression and at the same time security? Uh, I think it would go a long way before I expand on that specific question. I would also like to take this opportunity and commend uh, Ian and the co-author and our colleagues at the exhaustive and impressive report that would really be useful to a wide range of actors, both in India and also, I assume, uh, internationally. In India, uh, whenever policy is formulated, uh, the country's policymakers always uh, look uh, to the West uh, for both uh, good ideas and bad ideas. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. they focus on cherry picking uh, worse practices. And I think uh, efforts such as these that bring uh, greater clarity uh, to the discussion, that also foreground important evidence, is uh, uh, very important. And uh, I think uh, the report uh, in its current form and perhaps future research that builds down Have we lost Sunil completely? Right, okay. Um, well, we managed to catch um, a little bit. I think we may be uh, toying with these um, these problems. Bob, maybe um, I would like to ask Bob and um, uh, Dan as the report has been uh, separated out between companies and, and governments, Bob, what is your, your response to the recommendations, um, a, a, a very good list of recommendations? To what degree do you think not just Google but other companies in this sphere are already abiding by them and to what degree is there room for improvement? Well, I, I guess I would start um First, uh, just by thanking G and I for putting this together, and especially Susan and uh, David and German for the work they've done here, uh, and uh, for, for to Ian and his co-author for the work they've done on this report. It's uh, comprehensive uh, and very helpful, I think. Um, let me start by saying, uh, in, in response to your question, John, that I actually want everybody to understand that governments uh, are the primary problem here not companies. And I, I think that the challenge begins with the governments and then goes to the companies. Uh, we are in a situation where around the world, companies are faced with what I would call forced compliance. 
You either do what the government says or you don't get to operate in that country. And I think that's a very important thing that's lost now often in these discussions. Uh, and it's interesting that you put the recommendations for companies ahead of those uh, uh, for, for governments at the end of your report and in the executive summary, uh, simply because uh, I think it reflects a, a current thinking about this, uh, about this area and this problem. Uh, am I saying that companies are doing everything right and they don't uh, have responsibilities? Of course not. Uh, but I, I do believe that we l have lost sight of that important thing. Now, that being said, uh, how are companies doing? Uh, depends on the company. Uh, I mean, I know that's a, a gray and unsatisfactory answer, and everybody wants a black and white answer, but I'm not going to give one uh, simply because uh, there's a huge gap between uh, where we are with certain hardware companies uh, and where we are with companies that are uh, exporting technology to regimes that they know are going to use it the wrong way, if you'll excuse the expression the wrong way, there's a black and white uh, expression, that they're going to, regimes that are going to use it in order to spy on their own citizens or to track down their own citizens who are in opposition to that regime, uh, to be more specific, uh, and between other kinds of companies that are trying to uh, do the right thing. Uh, and by the right thing, I mean protect free expression uh, and uh, uh, protect users. Um, if I was going to have to say, uh, you know, how are companies doing overall? Uh, I would say uh, not great. Uh, how are certain companies doing? Uh, I think we're getting better uh, when it comes to transparency, uh, when it comes to cooperation with non-companies, uh, again, a, a lousy expression, but uh, other actors uh, in the field, uh, with reaction time, uh, and with offering everything from practical solutions such as two-step verification, transparency report, things like that, to macro policy solutions. Uh, and also advocacy where companies are coming together uh, in, in relation, for example, to India, as we did uh, with Facebook and others there, in order to uh, counteract what we see as extraordinarily bad um, trends and uh, ideas that the uh, government has had there. Well, I'm sure um, members of the audience and other panelists will uh, have questions to you on that and on Google's record and, and the broader record on, on companies. But Dan, first of all, respond to Bob's uh, first remark, which is the problems l uh, reside predominantly with governments. I, I think that's generally true. Uh, I, I think, um, I, I think um, there are very few companies who set out to target human rights activists and there are a number of governments who do. And so um, with that, that being said, in the same way that Bob answered, it depends on the company, which is accurate, it also depends on the government. And I think you can, uh, I mean, I think, first of all, that the report is very helpful in, in kind of laying out a landscape of issues that generally get talked about at events like this, and, and particularly the challenge, um, you know, there, there are basically two broad areas of challenge that come up with respect to governments and, and companies and internet freedom broadly construed. One is a set of security challenges, which this report focuses a great deal on. The other is a set of uh, commercial challenges, particularly intellectual property, which this doesn't touch on as much, but a lot of the, the the supposed hypocrisy or, or conflicts or very real tensions emerge around one of those two camps. And I think that with regard to the security challenges, you can, rather than divide um, good governments from bad in the first instance, you ask the question of whether governments start from a premise that security challenges can be met in a way that is consistent with principles and obligations under, under international law, or they start from a premise that they can't. And for the ones who start from the premise that they can't, first of all, if you dig deeper, you find out that their security challenge is not uh, only countering terrorism. <laughs> um, usually it's often you know, countering the justified demands of their own citizens to have more of a say in how they're governed, et cetera. So that it's, it's a broader context for those governments. 
Um, so there's a bigger picture to look at. But for the ones who are committed to it, I think you know, the challenge lies both uh, for, for us in terms of um, uh, the practical challenge of figuring out how to meet security needs while um, being consistent with principles in our own house, and also how to encourage others, um, many of whom have uh, much broader challenges because they are illegitimate governments who are oppressing people, um, how to encourage them to respect the, the rights of their citizens. So I, I, I don't take issue with, with Bob's characterization. But as, as you've alluded to, there are two main areas. There is one, the practice um, in your own backyard. There is um, to what degree do uh, de democratic governments uh, practice what they preach, or to what extent are the restrictions laid on the internet for whatever reason, usually under the guise of terrorism, anti-terrorism and security, are they sort of manna from heaven? Are they the perfect get-out clause for... And also protecting children. Right. Um, but I mean, for example, uh, today, um, even the UK government has just um, unveiled its data commu communications bill in Parliament, uh, seeking uh, considerably more access to uh, social media data um, and uh, a considerable amount of other uh, data from individuals, again, under the uh, guise of um, anti-terrorism. Do you, uh, and, other, and other measures, as you said uh, as well, Bob, do either of you see this as this kind of thing? You can understand why it makes it much easier for oppressive governments to act in the way they do. I understand the um, opportunistic precedent harvesting um, of, uh, of oppressive governments, of the discrete practices of governments, some of which are, are completely justified of, go of other governments that operate within a framework of rule of law. And I think one of the challenges of this conversation broadly is distinguishing between uh, a lawful intercept that is done according to procedures that are published, that have been debated in a democratically ele elected legislature, that are appealable, et cetera, where nobody is picked up in a black van and disappeared off the street and never heard from again, and a lawful intercept that results in somebody getting picked up in a black van, tortured, and, and never heard from again. Th those are different contexts. And obviously, this is a very, there's, that's not a sound bite. Um, and so, um, I think there's a real challenge, yes, in, in making sure that um, we are reasoning through arguments in terms of how we are applying our principles to solve practical challenges, to making sure that we are bringing the context into the picture so that opportunistic precedent harvesting can't take place um, or is, is more difficult, um, and, and to making the case for the broader set of changes that need to happen. It's not just that that uh, these governments need to not use um, uh, intercepts to, to target human rights activists. It's also that they need to have um, protections for human rights. They need to have uh, transparent courts. They need to have a whole range of other reforms that, that allow governments to be able to solve real challenges in a way that do is consistent with rights over the long run. Gillian, bring you in, in here both to comment on that area, the area of Western governments and their practices and to what extent do these recommendations help uh, in that area? But also, uh, with regard to companies, um, Bob used the term enforced um, uh, restrictions. Um, do you uh, take the view that some companies in certain countries, um, and you can cite some precedents if you wish, uh, accede to the pressure all too easily? Yes. Um, so first, I would also like to thank GNI for uh, hosting this and for having us, and, and uh, the authors of the paper, of course. Um, so f to respond to the first bit, I would say, you know, I, I actually fundamentally agree with you, Bob, that it, the countries are the problem and not the companies. And yet at the same time, I think that the targeting of companies um, is, for me, within the context of, you know, you can't fix China, you can't fix Iran. And so in those cases, it makes sense. But at the same time, a lot of these companies have been doing an excellent job with the countries that sort of fall in the middle ground, India being a great example of that. I, I don't know if we have Sunil back. But, um, but to the second question, do I think that in some cases companies are ceding too easily? I would say yes. Um, I think that you know, we've seen uh, a number of companies um, willingly offer to restrict certain types of content um, based on various laws in various countries. And Google you know, has been very transparent about this. I would say other companies have not been so transparent. Um, we've seen 
over the past year, um, you know, Twitter now um, saying that they will indeed take down certain types of content um, if it's legally required. I don't know that we've seen any instances of this aside from uh, intellectual property just yet. Um, and then, you know, you do have a number of other social media companies and up and coming social media companies that are not taking the transparency aspect of this seriously. Um, and so I guess what I would say is that, you know, I would love to see more companies, whether by force or by preferably voluntarily, um, follow Google's lead with that type of transparency report. I think that that's the first step. Um, while acknowledging that this is a matter of, you know, it is the problem of the countries and not the companies, but it's nonetheless necessary to report on it. What about the recommendations such as um, companies uh, actively trying to support the people who are being forced to uh, hand over data or um, uh, put under pressure from these restrictions and also the uh, requirement to uh, receive uh, a legally binding physical receipt of, of the request um, which can then be challengeable in, in courts. Are these routes that uh, you think both for companies and also the question of Western embassies in those countries, um, is that realistic? I think that's, I'm not sure that I've got a good answer for that. Um, not a straight answer uh, anyway, but um, ultimately, um, you know, I think that the companies in the room here, the companies that are participating in GNI are aware of this, but there's so many more. Um, and uh, I think that we're not, it's not going to be realistic until more companies come to the table. Um, Sunil, I just wanted to check, first of all, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, I can. Before hopping off, I as soon as you start Hello. speaking, you freeze again, unfortunately. Um, can you, um, Sunil, can you just start, and we'll have to cut you off if you do free. Oops, he's gone. Well, um, he did try. Could you use the device? I think that if you mute us, because I think when noise gets picked up from us, it intercepts the, it, it blocks the, like when you're. Right, right. David, any. Uh, well, we'll do what we can. Um, apologies um, to Sunil and um, and to uh, the audience. Um, Ian, let's br let's bring you in in here. This this question it's not a binary thing issue of companies or governments, but to what degree do you think companies and Western governments, for want of a better term, democratic governments, should cooperate better? To what extent does that, in some ways, compromise the independence of companies in so doing? I agree with what, with what Bob has said. Yes, absolutely. As, as Ruggi pointed out and, and elsewhere, it is the, it, human rights protection is the responsibility of states. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't have that fear, John. Um, I, I don't worry that companies working closely with, with democratic governments compromises um, their position. Uh, of course, having the measures in place like transparency, as, as several speakers have said, um, puts a sort of protection in place uh, against that happening. So I, I think that's very positive. Obviously, things are slightly different when it comes to the, the, the repressive regimes. And ultimately, I, I think two, imp two important points. First of all, as, as Gillian said, the companies in the room here, by and large, are not the problem. They are making a significant effort through GNI and through, through other mechanisms to take voluntary action to deal with some of these constraints. The concern is the companies that aren't in the room and the the absolutely legitimate problem that if, if states try to persuade companies to do everything voluntarily, that you end up um, rewarding the bad actors, the ones that will not come to the table and act in a, in a responsible way. Can I, can I just yeah, come in on this? I, I actually am going to disagree that protecting human rights is a responsibility of states. And I think you're reading Ruggie very narrowly here, and Christine Bader is here, and maybe she can um, pitch in on this in the question period, but the way that I read it is that it's the responsibility of all of us. Uh, every institution, every international organization, every NGO, every company uh, should in some way work to protect human rights. Uh, and I actually find the Ruggie principles a little bit weak. Uh, in, in the way that they are, are worded. And we, we don't have to get deep into wording here, because uh, that's boring, um, uh, frankly. Uh, but I was considering them when I was reading over your paper. And it strikes me that 
protect, respect, and remedy, uh, which are the basic words used in Ruggie, are really not quite there, especially when it comes to trafficking and information and the stuff that companies uh, like ours deal with. Because protect is too late. Um, respect is passive. Respect human rights is just a, is a, is a really lousy way to express it to, to, to me. And, and the final one, remedy, is overpromising. Because a remedy is a cure. It's, it's some way that you can fix what's gone wrong. So instead, uh, at, at the risk of upsetting Christine and others who worked for years uh, on getting those words right, I, I would suggest prevent instead of protect, because that's trying to do something before, as a company or as an individual or as an NGO, you do something dead wrong. Um, protect as the second one instead of respect simply because it has more oomph to it. And the last one is mitigate instead of remedy because I don't think when you mitigate something you've done wrong, you're overpromising. All you're trying to do is fix your mistake. And the one thing I can promise you when it comes to this field is that every company involved in trying to protect human rights is going to make a mistake at one point or another. Dan, what about the point about territorial and extraterritorial? Um, how does that affect, for example, um, U.S. law enforcement? If there is email traffic, um, uh, f say, between Pakistan and France that you uh, regard as, as potentially suspect on, on uh, terrorism questions, where does jurisdiction begin? Where does jurisdiction end? And if governments such as the U.S., U.K., Germany and others are seeking either through the cloud or through cooperation with companies or countries elsewhere, extraterritorial extra uh, jurisdiction, should that not then apply to other, gov other countries too? Um, I'm going to be honest and say I'm probably um, already out of my depth uh, in <laughs> terms of, um, it, I'm not a lawyer and I don't work in law enforcement and I know that there are a number of complex uh, international agreements and bilateral agreements including MLATs, which are covered in the, in, in the report, that, that make arrangements for, um, you know, in the United States case, for you know, U.S. efforts to uh, protect against terrorist attacks or, 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 um, or prosecute and investigate and prosecute um, international crime, et cetera. Um, and I think in many cases it's therefore not a question of jurisdiction per se, but rather whether agreements are in place in order to, to, to access information. Um, I do want to come back to something that, no, that both Jillian and Bob said. I, um, one of the things that Jillian said that I, I had intended to say early on was even though that it's, um, uh, that I agree that the, and what Bob said originally was not that it was the responsibility of governments to protect, but actually that governments were those who were the greatest, viol the original violators. Um, it wasn't that the companies were, were out to, to get folks. And I think, you know, that being true, sitting in the position of, uh, a government official who's mainly externally focused in terms of how do we help make sure that protections are in place and that people are, people's rights are, are less violated abroad. One of the things that's obvious to me, especially, you know, um, the, the challenges with export controls, for example, um, that are discussed and, and ha having them have practical import, et cetera. One of the problems is not only having companies not make monumentally bad decisions, but, but it's also how do we get companies to be part of, help us be part of the solution. Companies are much more innovative, generally speaking, than governments. And so I see it as even though the companies, uh, the governments may be the source of the bad, um, the companies are in many cases in a position to be the sources of the good and to be able to, and, and the, the boundaries between companies not doing wrong and, and being innovators in terms of protections um, are, are blurred because, for example, a due diligence process is a, a management innovation for many companies, um, but it, and it's one that prevents bad behavior on, on their part, inadvertent bad behavior on their part, um, but it's also an innovation. And I think there are innovations of management and innovations of product that uh, can both be part of the solution set here and probably are more promising than, than many of the 
tools that are open to governments um, looking at supporting human rights over, uh, overseas. Let me just make one point, though. I mean, Dan speaks from a State Department uh, viewpoint. Uh, it is not as if the government of the United States is a monolith. And if Dan was to launch a campaign tomorrow for there to be a transparency report by the U.S. government to show everything that it is asking for and why it's asking for it and what the reactions are, certain agencies that have three letters plus the <laughs> Department of Justice uh, plus probably the Defense Department would all violently object to the production of such a report. So um, you're, you're frowning. Me? Yes. Well, yes, I'm frowning, but I, you know, whatever I can. We'll look forward to the frown. Oh, we'll yeah. look forward to the frown. <laughs> the frown um, will take verbal substance in one second. <laughs> anyway, I, I just point out the difficulty of, of transferring a product from, you know, from a private arena into a public arena. I think we, it's time for questions. Um, that I think there'll be quite a few and, and pushbacks, um, which will be great. Um, just to say, um, the Twitter feed again, uh, the hashtag is GNI2012. There's been some, a lot of, um, of good tweets, more on a reporting, in a reporting manner than comments or questions. So if either anybody here has questions, they would rather tweet, or anybody outside would rather tweet um, questions. Um, please uh, go ahead and do so. We have a microphone. Um, when uh, you are called to speak, please just briefly introduce yourself, because although you'll be, be familiar to many here, for people outside watching, um, that you need to be identified. Um, right. Yeah, lady there. Um, yep, go, go ahead. And then here. Thank the, yes, that's right. right. Hi, I'm Christine Bader. I was working with Tom <laughs> so, yeah, on the exactly. Guiding Principles. Um, so I agree that word definitions are terribly boring. So what I would encourage everybody to do is actually read the guiding principles, um, which do spell out explicitly that protect is about stopping people from getting hurt um, before it happens. Uh, respect explicitly spells out a proactive due diligence process that companies are supposed to undertake. And remedy is about, well, yeah, if you contribute to harm, I think it's reasonable to expect that you should also contribute to at least making sure that people have access to a mechanism where that wrong could be righted. Um, what the guiding principles do not say, however, is in something that was in your report, um, that companies have a duty to, uh, to refuse violations, um, sorry, to refuse state requests that violate human rights. Um, Minimize compliance with them. Yeah, the, the guiding principles actually um, don't say that. Um, and so I think it's a reasonable interpretation of what they do say, but I do think it's quite important to distinguish what the guiding principles actually say um, from an interpretation of it uh, for a number of reasons that, that may well be obvious. But. Okay, Ian, do you want to come back? And Gillian, if you have yep. any observations on, on either the question or um, the brief remarks previously from um, Dan and, and Bob, and then we'll have the second question. No, that's right. And I, I, I tried, but maybe I failed in this case, to, to make clear which were direct quotes from the, the principles and uh, which were our interpretation of them, but that's fair. Okay. Eddie, yeah, <coughs> if we can um, move smiling, quickly, yeah. if we can move quickly along with the mic. Thank you. And, and then if you stay, no, here, no, 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 no to no. your other side, just behind it. Thanks. Yeah, it is. If you if you just keep it close to you. Uh, my name is Laura Ballard. Is, oh, it is on. Yeah. Uh, I, I also work at the State Department in a different uh, bureau than than Dan. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to comment on the on it this issue of transparency and uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, the issue of of uh, transported law enforcement access to data. And and just as a general comment on the report, I would say the one party that you need to be talking to that I, I don't think you talked to before preparation of the report is the Council of Europe. And the reason I say this is because I was just last week at the Octopus Cybercrime Conference, which for the first time really brought together uh, prosecutors, um, technology companies, cybersecurity companies, you know, Microsoft was there, um, uh, uh, prosecutors, investigative judges in a very major way. They actually now house cybercrime and privacy under the same division. There was one workshop in particular, which is an all-day workshop on transborder access to data by law enforcement. Uh, it was not for attribution, and if you were there, you would understand why it was not for attribution. Um, but, you know, there is, there is a wrap-up session that I can send you the link to. Where That'd you be very helpful. Yeah. Um, 
one, uh, among the many takeaways, I would say that this, this issue of transparency, the issue of MLATs, this is not an American problem. Um, this, this is definitely at least a European problem, and, and you know, certainly there was also a lot of outreach to the developing world that, that's going on with the Council of Europe, a lot of promotion of the Cybercrime Convention. So uh, you know, on the one hand, the Cybercrime Convention is a very useful tool um, to sort of give a structure to this, this issue of transborder access to data. But there was also one uh, magistrate in particular who stood up. He was from a Western European country. Uh, he's, he's one of the types of magistrates that have investigative powers in, in the area of counterterrorism. And his comment was, I, ha I have no use for MLATs. He said, in the age of cloud computing and proxy servers, I don't have time to figure out what 12 countries the data is passing through, much less um, direct an MLAT request to that country. This is just not going to work for me. So there were a lot of people who agreed with him and said, you know, we, real, we really need a paradigm shift as to how we approach these issues. So, you know, whether he's right or wrong, I would say that is a dialogue that we need to have because if we're not having a conversation with the really uh, responsible and sophisticated and human rights respecting law enforcement entities, then we're never going to have a, a, a common set of principles that, that we can join with Europe in sort of bringing, you know, the more repressive regimes to heel. And, then and, this just and can I just ask you then, sure. um, this prosecutor, this magistrate, prosecuting magistrate, how did he um, see the way forward in dealing with traffic that's on the cloud? Well, he said, you know, I have the authority under my domestic laws to pull that data. If I can access it from my country, I'm legally authorized to do so, and that's what I'm going to do. So we're back so to country by country jurisdictions. Yeah, I mean, he said that's the approach that's going to work for me. Now, there was a prosecutor from that same country who said, well, my, those authorities aren't available to me, right. and therefore I'm stuck trying to get data from, a, you know, a company, in fact, a U.S. company that didn't actually have a legal presence in Belgium. Or, well, now, now we know the country, but... Uh, <laughs> Your secret's safe with us. Right, okay, but I'm still not naming names. Um, but, uh, you know, so people's frustrations seem somewhat related to the legal authorities that they have at their disposal under domestic law and also the legal authorities in other countries to sort of assist them. So there needs to be a, a, a conversation on a wide variety of topics, like do we go through the MLATs? Can we work this out cop to cop? You know, because the cops want to work it out cop to cop. They don't want to go through the MLATs because that, takes, that's, that costs them time. So it's, it, it was a great conversation to have had and, and I think, you know, if there, there's follow-up events for you guys to have, I would, I would recommend talking to some of these guys at Council of Europe. Thank you. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, there's, a, there's a good tweet from Danny O'Brien um, sitting there, second row. Um, <laughs> yes. Your tweet, your tweet, sorry. No, it's just simply, it's a, it's a call out. Anyone got any questions for Google, the State Department, and NGOs like EFF, CPJ on human rights? We have them all in the room. Um, <laughs> John, so, come you back. said go back to country by country jurisdiction, what did you mean by that? Well, I'm just saying, how do you resolve uh, when you have st uh, um, traffic based in country, not based in the cloud, then the jurisprudence is sure surely clearer on that. Developing that jurisprudence with traffic on the cloud is, is, is surely the challenge, is it not? Yes. I, I, I just am, I, I am, I don't know if the word is tired, but perhaps exhausted. Uh, is a better word uh, in, uh, in hearing the expression borderless internet or uh, or such uh, or, or something like borderless internet because the fact of the matter is if you're looking at it from a company's perspective or a government's perspective mm. there is no such thing as a borderless internet yep. every time you cross a border a new law comes into effect and it means that you have to react to a different case on free expression or privacy in a different way. And can, can I just come say back, come I, back in. I, that absolutely, those are the kind of challenges we, that's what we mean when we say develop and streamline the MLAT framework. I'm not, we're not necessarily saying, I, qu I quite understand what you're saying. It, it should remain a very traditional, bila slow bilateral to bilateral process, absolutely not. We do talk to the Council of Europe on an ongoing basis and we've made, we've made specific recommendations to, to IGOs like the Council of Europe that this is something they could support moving forward. And Dan, apart from agreeing 100% with your colleague, is there anything you'd like to uh, um, add to, to those remarks? No, we'll just move to my question. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. Ben. Um, okay. And then uh, another hand up, so we can, yeah, then two rows behind after Thank that. You. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, John. Um, I just want to briefly uh, build on uh, my friend Christine Bader's uh, response to the very important point that uh, 
Bob Borston made uh, about the Ruggie framework and how it relates to GNI in particular. Um, the GNI principles were developed apart from, but in full awareness of the uh, then uh, evolving protect, respect, remedy framework, uh, which was released, if I recall correctly, Christine, uh, in the spring of 2008. And thanks in part to you, uh, your participation in the GNI process, our efforts to finalize uh, the draft GNI principles in the first half of 2008 were informed by that framework. That said, uh, I believe that the GNI principles, and I think this point was alluded to earlier, uh, in fact by Ian explicitly so, and in the report and in your very good opening remarks, uh, the GNI principles um, go much further than the guiding principles. The guiding principles, as terrific as they are, are simply but powerfully a foundation for companies in virtually every industry to understand and address human rights risks and responsibilities alike. What GNI does is to provide an operational a framework for addressing very specific issues in this particular context of freedom of expression and right to privacy. One last point, and just to hit Bob's uh, concern, uh, or observation rather, right on the head, is that <coughs> I think that the GNI principles blur or meld, and quite constructively so, even if unconsciously at the time, the ruggy duty to protect on the part of governments and the company duty to respect on the part of companies. And especially so uh, in the context of uh, censorship of content uh, and also uh, responding to government's uh, requests for data on individual users for su support uh, purported national security reasons, which is the main focus of this report. So without getting into any further detail, that ambiguity, which may be uncomfortable for some, I think is actually constructive for companies. And while these issues certainly, as all the panelists have emphasized, uh, uh, lie first and foremost with governments, there is a company duty, I think, not only to respect but to protect human rights in certain ways that I think that the GNI principles and implementation guidelines uh, help take forward. Thank you, Bennett. Uh, gentleman there, just to pass it through you, Rose. That's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Don Kraus with globalsolutions.org. And this is a, qu a question for Ian. Um, in your second part of your presentation, you talked about extending export controls uh, of, around arms, you know, arms controls to include dual-use information technologies. And I, I just wanted to get a little bit more from you and your thinking on that. It's a little bit apples and oranges. You know, we're involved in negotiations on an arms trade treaty right now, for example, that happens in July up in New York. And, you know, the, the parts of government, the parts of civil societies that are thinking about guns and bullets are really not thinking about inf information technology. And there are different parts of the State Department and foreign ministries. And a lot of that treaty is about actually getting countries to establish export controls that have no export controls or very, very few. How do you envision connecting the dots on that and bringing together some groups of people who really think of themselves and, and working on different kinds of things where actually you're right, they both can go towards really protecting human rights, but it's, it's making those connections and, and pulling that together that seems to be a pretty high bar to, to be able to achieve. Yes, I think, I think that's, that's right. One, one reason we emphasized Vassanar in, in our report is that they, they, they've dealt very extensively with the, the dual-use goods already, as well as the single-use, purely military um, goods. You're quite right that it's entirely different sets of people. Um, so in the, in the UK, for example, we, we've, we've talked to um, uh, groups like Amnesty that are very involved in the, the areas you were, you were discussing have, have been less so in the past related to the internet. But it is something that they are, are getting into and, and want to further develop. And so I know it's almost trite to, to, to talk about multi-stakeholderism and the, the question is how do you make it work in practice? But that's why we, we recommended getting that process rolling, but we wouldn't claim to have easy answers to the, that problem. Julia? I think the arms question is tricky. I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a clear answer on how that convergence can come about. Um, EFF, uh, for our part, we've thought about it along the lines of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act instead um, in terms of being able to 
create transparency around what governments, uh, particularly around dual use technologies, what governments are exporting, um, to whom they're exporting it, uh, what it's being used for, et cetera. And I think that that's the first step. Um, and you know, I've, I've gone through my own sort of evolution on this over the last year from voluntary to perhaps at least the transparency aspect of it needs to be enforced. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I just um, chip in here. I think that um, the, the ultimate object of these, whatever the, whether it's transparency, whether it's export controls, et cetera, um, you know, for all the reasons that you laid out, it's, it's challenging to have it be, um, uh, frankly, uh, you know, it's challenging to expect high, a high degree of actually limiting the amount of equipment that gets to places that you don't want it to get. Um, but it isn't challenging to imagine it creating norms of shame, et cetera, and, and things like that. And, and those things do, I mean, again, looking at the broader context over time, being associated with um, having to only do business with companies that, that uh, or countries that, that are known to not be transparent, et cetera, that, that there, are, there are other costs in the broader relationship. And just as a point of fact, I work on both, uh, actually I supervise an office that has both the internet freedom team and the arms vetting uh, for human rights team and I'm working on the ATT as well as um, uh, on other uh, technology issues. So there, there is some convergence and I, I had had the thought, I didn't want to raise it, but I had had the thought about whether or not people are thinking about New York, et cetera. But, um, so you know, I, th I, think, I think there's a reasonable conversation. I think if you hold the standard at will this lock up and and um, ban um, bad equipment from getting to bad people. Um, that's an unreasonable standard. It's not going to happen. It's not, it's never gonna be, we should never be wholly reliant on these, but we should be trying to figure out how to make them as effective as possible and, and recognize that they can have a variety of different kinds of effects. Let me just add very briefly that one of the most interesting points in Ian's paper is the point about the secondhand market. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's talk real world here. Uh, if we ban, let's just say that the U.S. Congress and the European uh, and European Parliament and every institution in Europe were to ban any uh, company from those countries in engaging in such transfers, uh, I have a feeling that Huawei might not pay attention uh, to that and might actually gain market share uh, around the world. But that doesn't mean it doesn't impose a cost. No, I'm not saying it doesn't impose a- only do business with Huawei because there are other costs to only doing business with one I, I understand that, and, and I'm, but I, I do want to just you know, be very clear about the difficulty yeah. of approaching this through uh, legislation that affects only companies in certain countries. Uh, and are there other ways, which you also raise, technical, technical ways, technological ways, and I'm not a lawyer or a technologist, let me be clear about that, thankfully, um, uh, that would act, uh, that, would, that would succeed in uh, stopping uh, those technologies from being used uh, in the ways we were describing earlier? Well, as, as uh, several speakers are um, uh, saying that they have no uh, legal um, background, are there lawyers in the room who would like no, to... No, um, this is, exactly, Washi this uh, is anyway. Washington, D.C., but there are no lawyers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So th Thank you. I'm Sharon Hom from mm. Human Rights in China, and we are one of the founding NGOs of GNI. I'm a human rights lawyer, so people, some people think that that's not a real lawyer. But <laughs> uh, So um, I wanted to thank uh, Ian and Dorn for a really useful uh, paper. And I hope that GNI and the broader public that's engaged with these issues will really look to the paper as a discussion paper that helps them move us forward. Because I don't think it was intended to be a... Um, like a blueprint that we were going to implement. I think, so there were a number of quick comments, and I'm sorry, I hope this is not too little too late um, for the paper, uh, and for GNI in particular for us in moving and implementing, I think, some of it. Because it's really like a good map. I think it's a map of a, uh, some of the really relevant issues, but the map is not the territory. Because in this particular territory, in ICT, both the technology and the 
regulatory framework domestically of domestic jurisdictions and the international normative are all in flux right now. So, so I wanted to say that. Um, I stand with Bob Borstein. Let's talk about the real world. So let me say something about like uh, jurisdiction. Users, end users, Chinese users, Chinese citizens, like we're in an actual jurisdiction. So we may think we're in cyberspace and we're, we're transcending borders and all that, but at the end of the day, it will be the Chinese public security that will come knocking on the door and we'll be in a Chinese prison. So I think it's important to keep in mind that while they are international and blah, 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 that the reality is that people still live, you know, until they're downloaded. We're still in a real physical uh, jurisdiction. So that's, that's one, I think. Um, the second thing is, um, um, I think it's important to build the norms. <laughs> I, I have been trying to be downloaded into a cybernetic no, no, body, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, but it's just not happening. So um, the second thing is on Vasanar, it's important to look at it, but except for the fact that it leaves out most of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, except for that, well, Mrs. Lincoln, did you enjoy the show? So it's, it's kind of like a big but, but it still is at least a starting place. Um, the second thing is on whether we might take a little bit more look at regional frameworks, which have a vastly important negative impact on issues like terrorism and human rights, uh, human rights and, tra you know, et cetera. And the one, of course, I'm obviously referring to is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has a very bad approach to terrorism because it links it normatively and in implementation with splitism and separatism, which is not part of the international. The other thing is um, the members, including India and Pakistan, is observer states. So we should be careful about thinking that everybody's, there are good governments and bad governments. I think there's always a question of what do you do when good democratic governments do bad things? So so we should move to a more nuance of saying the world is good governments, repressive governments, and bad governments, except with the exception of China. I think we should say it's a repressive government. You know, and there, but yeah. that, it's also not monolithic, and there are some reformer voices right now that's peeping up. You know, But I do think we need more nuance about splitting the world into bad and good governments and bad and good companies, because it, that's one thing we have learned from GNI and uh, in our participation. So I think that's important. Um, so the, the one thing to... Um, also keep in mind is when you look at ICCPR, which we always do when we talk about international, we really ought to not forget the implementation mechanisms for those treaty bodies. And that's an opportunity for both policy and norm building because that's where the jurisprudence develops, that all of the treaty signatory member states in fact have to go through an implementation supervisory transparent review and that's where we can have some input as multi-stakeholder, as individual, you know, as NGOs, etc. And the one thing I would recommend us to push on your recommendations is for governments and multilateral bodies that, um, you know, as an NGO, I think we want to be part of all those processes. So I think one recommendation should be that they should include civil society and NGOs in those norm setting, like wicked, you know, uh, processes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Dan, maybe if you can come back on, on this point about uh, well, not just uh, the, the potentially negative influence of um, uh, regional groups like uh, the Shanghai Development um, Body um, bringing Russia and China and the, the various stands together is not uh, likely to induce great um, confidence in human rights. But um, more generally, what about the question of different countries that feel entirely emboldened to interpret the threat of terrorism as they see fit? Um, you know, I, I think it's a unavoidable challenge. I think it, um, obviously we have a concern not only, we should be concerned about um, exploiting the term not only because of it's exploited in order to perpetrate uh, abuses, but also because it cheapens the coin of a very real, uh, and, and, and therefore, um, you know, unhelpfully broadens what is aimed at being a very focused effort to target a very real threat, which is real terrorism. Um, and so there you can object on both uh, prudential and, and moral grounds. Um, <coughs> I, I agree that regional organizations are a real challenge. It, yet, I mean, I, they, you, first of all, as a practical matter, can't remove them from the map of, of diplomatic engagement, et cetera. And, and second of all, I'm not sure you would want to because there are opportunities there, but it's incredibly difficult because um, it's incredibly difficult to make progress in 
a bunch of different regional organizations. Let's leave the SCO out, which I, I, for all the reasons that Sharon highlighted is, is highly problematic, but there are other regional organizations that we hope have some promise um, in you know, the OAS or the AU, and I'm not speaking, strictly speaking on internet uh, level, but just in general. Um, and the OAS has, has a long track record of being a constructive contributor to good governance in, in, in the hemisphere, et cetera. The AU is this emergent ASEAN, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then the OSCE, which I think, you know, is actually a model for being founded on the idea that security, e economics, and human rights are inter unavoidably intertwined and need to be pursued in tandem, et cetera. And so regional organizations are, are critically important. But the challenge is not only are there some that are less constructive than others, but also, you know, once you establish a standard in one, if the standard in another doesn't look exactly the same, then you kind of erode the idea of standards. Um, and, and so there's this, this ch practical challenge in terms of advancing um, universal standards in region, in step by step. Obviously, this is something that's mirrored in the, in the challenge of state by state um, advances, so. Do you want to come in? Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on something else that Sharon said, which was this idea of separating countries between good and bad. Um, and I think that this, you know, in terms of one of the things I was thrilled to see in the paper was um, commentary on the existing export control regimes that do, in fact, punish the citizens rather than the, the governments. Um, what I've seen is in the case of Iran and Syria, which have had the strictest regulations, and, and let me be clear, on Syria, these regulations emerged in 2004 out of something that frankly does not appear to be a U.S., a, a definitive U.S. interest. Um, Syrian, I believe, Lebanese Sovereignty and Syrian Accountability Act, which prevented things until recently, such as Google Earth, from being downloadable by Syrian citizens. And it's hard for me to see how that particular tool could be used by a government against its citizens. I'm sure it could be, but um, needless to say, you know, in that case, I think what we've seen is my own, our own government, the U.S. government, deciding in those two cases that Iran and Syria are terrible places, which, I mean, sure, they are extreme human rights violators, but so is Bahrain, so is Saudi Arabia. Um, and so when we've seen these new efforts, such as the Global Online Freedom Act, um, to restrict the export, I'm concerned, again, that we're going to see a distinction, particularly you know, in the wording of that bill, um, we're going to see a, a distinction between what's a good government, what's a bad government, and you know, I don't think Saudi Arabia is gonna end up on the bad government list, despite their extreme restriction on political speech. Um, and so I, you know, I think that just when we think about these things, obviously I, I do feel that the first step should be transparency, but I also think that we do need to be very clear about good versus bad. Um, and, and not trying to separate into those buckets. We've got time for one more question, uh, or maybe we'll fit into a um, gentleman there with the blue tie. Nick Delay, yes. Nick Delay, uh, PwC. I work in our sustainability practice, and essentially what we do is we help companies do the right thing in a way that makes business sense, right? And you can do a couple of things. You can approach it with a risk compliance or moral responsibility so, I'm angle. I'm sorry, the name of your firm? PricewaterhouseCoopers. Oh, PwC. PwC, yeah. PwC. And um, so you can, you know, to help companies do the right thing in a way that makes business sense, I suppose you can approach it from a risk compliance or moral responsibility angle, and it works sometimes. Um, or you can actually say to companies, you, if you do the right thing, you're going to achieve those benefits, tangible benefits, intangible benefits, and you put a dollar value on those. Tangible benefits, it's easy. Intangible benefits, a little harder. So my question to the panel is this. If protecting online freedom of expression is a good thing for businesses, has anyone ever attempted to actually quantify the business benefits that corporations would achieve by doing so? such as, for example, increasing user uh, satisfaction, user value, user retention, reducing litigation costs, you know, uh, improving brands, you know, whatever it is. So I would be curious to see if anyone has tried to look at the, I guess, more the carrot angle than the stick angle or the moral angle to mm. help companies uh, do more in this space. Thank you. Bob. Thank you, Dan. Uh, <laughs> as much as I love Bob, I don't... <laughs> that question had your name written all over it. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's a really interesting question. <coughs> Uh, which is my way of saying I don't believe so. Uh, if there is uh, research on this, I haven't seen it. Uh, but it's, it, it, there, there's no question that there are discussions that go on uh, about the value of reputation. And 
what reputation means to a company, and in turn, whether or not uh, investor, uh, investor attitudes are changed by the way that companies uh, act. Uh, and I, I don't have uh, quantified, uh, quantifiable evidence uh, on those questions uh, to, to, to give you uh, uh, in return for your question. Uh, I, I do think, though, that uh, there's, there's little question that once a company starts to act in the right way, uh, inverted commas, uh, that in the West, quote unquote, uh, also, um, you get uh, a favorable backlash, uh, if that's not an oxymoron, and I apologize. Uh, you get a favorable lash. reaction from NGOs and others uh, that uh, in bolstering your reputation does help in the long run, I think. Um, but I can't give you anything quantifiable on that. Can I? Go ahead. I, I mean, I, I love Bob, and I think Bob is a great human being, but. Bob, Bob is here because Google sees value in the broad range of engagements that Google does to advocate for a free and open internet and protect netizens and stuff like that. And so there's, I mean, obviously there's a business case to be made. I think the business case ends up getting made more in a downside protection in, in the first instance, in a downside protection uh, way rather than an upside potential way. And I think there's no question that there are when when bad things happen, their uh, reputational things happen, there is a um, there is a potential knock-on effect in both your cost of capital and in consumer yeah. um, uh, reactions. I think that the other downside protection that 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 is difficult to um, to separate out each company's interest in is the fact that all firms, both har hardware, software, uh, um, and internet firms, have a um, have a stake in the internet remaining a free and open platform um, for the growth of their business. And so I think that's one where it's not, where there's a collective action problem and there are certain firms that are leading on, on advocating. And you can't separate out, I mean, importantly, the, the, the front runners here understand that you can't separate out the free and open platform that, that you need in order to sell more cable or to, in order to acquire more users in these countries from protecting the particular users who are, who are being, because they're being targeted by regimes that are also laying the blanket restrictions that, that, that restrict the internet as a free and open platform. And so I think there, that's the interesting case yeah. where how do you harness, how do you make the case to the industry as a whole, which obviously the GNI play, play, has a role to play in, but how do you make the case to the industry as a whole that they all have an investment in this thing called the free and open internet, and it, it needs to be protected in order to protect against downside risk. And, and I, would, I, I would say basically that I guess you could summarize this uh, uh, in, in a way by saying it is hard to untangle a corporation's right to sell ads on the open and free internet from the users of that corporation services right to express themselves. They go hand in hand. Uh, as a result, if you look at the, um, if you look at, uh, for example, the current movement by companies uh, to link the free flow of information uh, with economic growth around the world, there's no question that you know, we're doing that in part because we want countries to realize that you can't have one without the other. That they can't have direct foreign investment by companies without guaranteeing the fact that data is going to flow across borders. I would refer you specifically to the National Foreign Trade Council's uh, paper on this, uh, on this issue, NFTC. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting paper. And it includes uh, both people from the IT sector and from the financial services sector. We brought together an interesting alliance of companies uh, in uh, producing uh, that evidence. I would also point to an issue that's not, I don't think, raised sufficiently in the paper, but is one that is becoming increasingly important, and that is the location of data centers and demands by countries around the world that in order to provide services or products in those countries, you must locate yeah. data centers in those countries. Yeah. That poses all, that issue in and of itself mixes everything we're discussing 
today. Security, economics, privacy, uh, all of this come to bear when it comes to these discussions. And there are companies such as Google which are uh, aggressively resisting uh, movements all over the world to do this. Um, time's up. Uh, if you haven't been able to ask a question, you can do so, obviously, in the next two sessions. The next session is going to look at some very specific uh, country case studies, uh, Sweden, Russia, Pakistan, and others. So your questions will be equally apposite um, to that. If we can reconvene at 11.15, please. Can I thank uh, you all for your engagement. It was a very good and lively session. Can I thank Sunil remotely, who has been following us assiduously on Twitter since, uh, since the line went down and commenting, so it's great from him. Can I thank Bob Borstin, Dan Baird, Gillian York, and the co-author of the report, Ian Brown. And it's coffee time. <laughs>